Welcome very much. We're just delighted that you've come to join us. I'm Rob Jackler, and I am chair of the department of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery. And for those of you who are not Greek, that's ear, nose, and throat. And um, I'm also the leader, if you will, of the initiative to cure hearing loss here at Stanford, which we're going to share you some thoughts uh, tonight about. And I want to welcome uh, Vince Cerf, who is very kind to join us. And you, Tom Evelyn, will do a proper introduction. But I found this wonderful picture of Vince. And I just imagine, I don't see it, but I just imagine that he has a leather patch on that elbow <laughs> along with the pipe in that way. And he carries two different popular names. One, the father of the internet. I mean, that's quite a profound title to have, truth be known. The other, which I like very much, is the chief internet evangelist. And I, I like it so much that I'm going to call myself from now on in the chief evangelist of the Stanford <laughs> Initiative to Cure Hearing Loss. I like that so very much. All right, so just to give you a little orientation to our plans this evening, uh, I'm going to begin with about a 15-minute talk to give you an orientation to the ear and to where science and hearing is going now. Then we're going to have Tom introduce Mr. Cerf. And then Mr. Cerf is going to give us his personal story about he and his wife and family relating to hearing loss. We're then going to have a fun panel where we ask all sorts of pointed questions and have a dialogue. And you all will have a chance to interact with all of the faculty involved in research here at Stanford, both somewhat at the panel, but after the panel, we're going to go ahead outside of this room. There are a series of round tables. And at each one of those tables, we will have one of our faculty. So for those of you interested in asking questions of the science um, or the medicine, please don't ask the basic scientists medical questions. But you can ask the doctors that, and we will do our best to help as much as we can. Now, I would like to introduce you to an absolutely delightful four-year-old by the name of Lily. Now, Lily was born with something called a connexin mutation, which is a, a problem in the DNA that codes for a protein essential for hearing. Now, Lily is thriving. She reads, she speaks beautifully, she wears hearing aids. But Lily has a problem with the hair cells of the inner ear, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Now, hearing loss is the most prevalent sensory disorder in man. Some two to three of every 1,000 children are born with a severe hearing impairment. Half of all seniors over the age of 70 are significantly impaired. And about 36 million American citizens have hearing impairment. And that means in the 7 billion people that walk this earth that there are many, many hundreds of millions of people who suffer from hearing loss. Now, of course, we all kind of understand this that hearing loss in a child can inhibit the ability to learn language. What makes us special as a species is the ability to communicate with each other, to share our ideas with our young, to think about abstractions that we communicate verbally. As you become older, the hearing loss with aging leads to isolation. And seniors today, many of us will live much longer lives than in the past. And you see this in seniors who withdraw from restaurants and don't enjoy life to the fullest in their senior years. Now, Helen Keller famously has an insight into the meaning of hearing loss. And because she was both blind and deaf, she said, you know, blindness separates me from things, but deafness separates me from people. Now, we are not talking about this part of the ear. We are talking about the busy stuff that's on the inside. Now, when sound comes into the ear, it goes down the ear canal and strikes the eardrum. It passes through three bones to the inner ear. And the inner ear sends a signal over the hearing nerve to the brain. And it's then passed upwards to be understood. Now, our real interest here is this elegant spiral called the cochlea. Cochlea is simply Greek for snail. Many fancy scientific and medical terms are common household items and foodstuff. Yeah. Now, 
When we look inside the cochlea, and here it is cut through its middle, you can see the, the fibers of the hearing nerve, and you can see here something called the organ of corti. Now the organ of corti, as you can see from this arrow, is actually analogous to the retina of the eye, where rods and cones sent light. This beautiful drawing is a Stanford original. We have an artist, Chris Graylap, we've worked with, and she made this beautiful projection. These are the key elements in hearing. Those cells, which when they vibrate, transmit the vibration to the nerves and up the nerves towards the brain. A high-pitched sound is in the lower part of the cochlea. Those hair cells live on a membrane, and when a sound enters the ear, this is a low tone. There's a characteristic part in the cochlea where the deflection is maximum and the hair cell stimulation is greatest. Once those hair cells have a signal, they go down the first nerves, the spiral ganglion, and up to the brain from the hearing nerve. Now there are connections, of course, in the brain, and they go all the way up to the temporal lobe here. And if you see in the lower right corner, you can see, um, this is a newfangled pointer, by the way, but you can see here on the temporal floor, this is adjacent to areas of vision and areas in which the sound in the hearing is converted to language and compared with memories and integrated into the other senses. Now I'm going to tell you a tale of two ears, with apologies to Charles Dickens. Now, when Dickens was alive and walking the earth, if you had a problem with your middle ear, the eardrum and ossicles, or your inner ear, there was nothing we could do for you. Now, the good news is, over the years of the 20th century and the early 21st century, we've been able to solve problems with much of the ear. But problems with the inner ear itself remain elusive, and, oh, and um, Lily has a problem of the inner ear, and our goal is to help Lily, and not just Lily, the many millions of people afflicted by inner ear conditions, that as of 2014, there is precious little we can do for them. If you look back 100 years ago, people said there's nothing we can do if your eardrum or your hearing bones are gone, but today these are solved problems. For example, you see up above here, we have a hole in the eardrum, and to the left, we're moving in a piece of the patient's tissue, and then here, we've patched the drum. This works in over 90% to restore hearing and to repair the drum. Now here's a disease, you see this little white plaque right there. When the hearing, when the eardrum vibrates, the Stapes, which should be like a piston pumping into the inner ear, become stuck because of calcium. Today, with microsurgery, we replace this with a little wire and a piston and restore normal hearing in most cases. So this is um, a great triumph, if you will. This wire is the size of a comma on a piece of paper, very small. Now, if you've lost your hearing bones, we have titanium devices that will replace all of the hearing bones if necessary. But when you have lost the hair cells of the inner ear, your inner ear looks like this. You just have a series of orange cells, as depicted here, without any of the hairs. This is an animation done by my colleague Nick Blevins. Nick is here who is a wonderful animator, showing how the hair cells disappear in hearing. But notice the yellow nerve fibers, they remain. When people say nerve deafness, it isn't. It's hair cell deafness in the inner ear. Now, many of you may have heard about the cochlear implant. This is an electronic device threaded through the turns of the cochlea, which will stimulate the hearing nerve. And in someone born deaf today, they can have partial hearing restored. But this technology, brilliant as it is, and I'm gonna predict, by the way, because this year's Lasker Prize was for cochlear implants, next year's, or the year after, Nobel Prize will be for the invention of the device. This is the first device that's ever replaced a human sense. It is not like bringing back normal hearing. A person with a cochlear implant still has impairments, but it's a great triumph. But it really isn't the answer that we'd like. 
Now I will comment to you that this device in large part began here at Stanford with the combination of Robert White and Blair Simmons, Blair Simmons the ear surgeon in my department, Robert White the chair of electrical engineering, and beginning in the early 60s, they began developing electrical stimulation. Many of the core technologies in today's cochlear implants happened a few hundred yards away. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the Stanford Initiative to Cure Hearing Loss is all about. To us, this is our Manhattan Project, right? This is, there is very little hearing research in the world compared with cancer research or research in the brain, or even for that matter, research in the eye. But that is gearing up rapidly. And it's gearing up rapidly because recent advances have given reason to think that we may categorically overcome all of the inner ear hearing loss in the coming years and decades. So our project, our Manhattan Project, is a large scale multidisciplinary project trying to invent a biological cure for lost hair cells in the coming years. Now, what the first glimmer of this was in the chicken. In the 1980s, they found that if you had a chicken's ear that was blasted and no hair cells, they regrew. And people began to say, can't that happen in humans? And the answer is no, it doesn't but it was tantalizing and suggested that that might come to pass. Now, when you think about regeneration, you think about things like the bone marrow and leukemia and stem cell transplants in the bone marrow, but solid organs in general, it hasn't been possible. And the reason is shown here when you look at a healthy liver and a cirrhotic liver. The problem is architecture. When you've lost your liver, you have a scarred little ball with no architecture. But when you've lost your hearing, the elegant cochlea with its spirals remains, and the organ of cordy remains. But what's lost is a population of cells, a limited population of cells. So it makes the target for restoration of function to the ear conceptually not easy by any means, but more achievable than it is for others. There are three broad categories that you'll hear from Dr. Heller and fellow scientists. And those are cellular therapy, popularly known as stem cells, gene therapy, and molecular modulation. Now, my favorite definition of a stem cell is a spherical cell, which when <laughs> injected in a laboratory animal produces a scientific paper. <laughs> now, when we think about where cells might come from, over the years there was much attention to embryos and umbilical cord blood, but more and more it's to what's called induced pluripotential cells. The person themselves have fat or blood or skin converted into a cell that can be stepwise manipulated into a mature hair cell. Very conceptually, the idea is that these cells are implanted and restore hair cells. This does not work for baldness. This is a very different <laughs> thing. I get to ask that question, so I'm <laughs> preempting it. Now, imagine Lily. If you were to take Lily cells and convert them to hair cells, they still have the error in her DNA. Her DNA does not produce a critical protein necessary called connexin for her hearing. So it isn't sufficient to make new hair cells, you have to reprogram those hair cells. And so Lily will need a splicing of DNA in to replace them, or else perhaps a cellular transplant from someone else who has a healthy gene in that location. Now there's much attention to using small molecules. It turns out today they're able to take a robotic system with 100,000 wells and test it against a certain enzyme and say, does any one of these 100,000 little compounds activate it. And that becomes important because you're looking to either transdifferentiate a cell or to proliferate it and take that scar cell, that cuboidal cell, and turn it into a sensory cell. This is what we aspire to be able to do in humans. And notice once you've made a hair cell, there is a tendency for the nerve fibers to sprout and reach out towards it and form a synapse. Now, this is Lily as a baby. That is not Lily as a fetus, however. Um, it's very important to realize that 
inside every person who has hearing loss, as a baby, the inner ear formed perfectly, by and large. So you have in your DNA a roadmap, if you will, to form a perfect cochlea and all the hair cells you need. There is much attention and much you will hear in our research that has to do with understanding how the organ of Cordy forms the first time around. Because there are master genes, something called ATO1, which conceptually, and it's been proven in concept, if you switch on that gene, there's a self-organizing cascade of events in an adult animal, which leads to the formation of hair cells. So manipulating the genes that control the development in an embryo and reactivating them in the adult life is one of those strategies. Now, as you can imagine, if you think about our view, we're looking, and we are, using a series of different concepts. We're looking at stem cell, gene therapy, molecular therapy, and even targeted stimulation. We're concentrating our efforts in many areas, but as a given area starts to show the most promise, we will tack towards it and begin to focus our resources towards the shared goal. Now, I want to introduce you to the um, a faculty who are involved in this research. We have an outstanding team. Our hope in the coming years is to double the size of that team. Um, this team was not here at Stanford 10 years ago. It's all new. We picked the best and brightest people from around the world and brought them here. Now, this is a group of some researchers. They like to dress casually in Hawaiian shirts. We then brought over the surgeon scientists, and you might notice a slight difference in the sartorial <laughs> tendencies. Um, I want to first mention Stefan Heller, who is the leader of our program and the head of the research. He became internationally famous in 2003 when he was the one to discover stem cells within the inner ear that could be converted into hair cells. Uh, Stefan at the time was a professor at a, <clears throat> some lesser East Coast institution in Cambridge. Um, and in fact, it is not often that a recruit makes the Sunday New York Times. It did. The, I don't have the Harvard Crimson one, but it read the same as this Boston paper, Stanford Steals Harvard Stem Cell Star. <laughs> um, this is an article um, about Stefan where he's creating um, cells within the inner ear that seem to have functional capabilities. Um, here you see him with Winston Churchill. He is indefatigable. He believes in victory. He will fight them on the beaches. He will fight them <laughs> on the hedgerows. Uh, this is Stefan's laboratory. Tony Ritchie. Tony Ritchie is here tonight. I'm looking for the red cap and back. Uh, Tony um, uh, is the world's greatest auditory physiologist. And he works through electrophysiologic rigs like this, able to study individual hair cells in great detail. Uh, Alan Chang is a young surgeon scientist. And Alan's goal is to understand which cells within the cochlea that's deaf actually are the origin of the new hair cells. And he was able to identify these in some superb research. John Ogilai, who's not here tonight, is an engineer. And John does a number of things, including um, working in blast injuries. He has a large grant from the Department of Defense that's very interested in the young men and women coming back from IEDs in Afghanistan. Okay? And this, of course, applies to all of us who enjoy rock music when we're young. And he, he does technological things. This is an optical coherence tomographer he uses to visualize in the inner ear. He looks at infrared spectroscopy of the brain in response to hearing. Uh, Nick Blevins is uh, also an ear surgeon, but Nick does microendoscopy. He uses these very tiny Grin lens microendoscopes to peer within the living ear for the first time. Kay Chang uh, is, um, helps children um, who are subject to ototoxic therapy. And we have at least one family here uh, whose child was cured of cancer but at the expense of hearing. And his goal is to, to make that not be. Mirna Mustafa, Mirna is an auditory geneticist. And Mirna works on the light washes it out, but the interaction between the hearing nerve and hair cells. And um, last question or two is why Stanford? Front page of the New York Times. Did you guys see this? If you'd, it says that uh, Harvard, you know, in today's minds of kids, Harvard is the Stanford of the East. 
It's true. It was probably written by a Harvard alum. <laughs> um, why, why Stanford for this? It's pretty obvious because we're able to bring together the best and the brightest here. Um, we have an incredible um, culture of science. It isn't just about this wonderful group of people, but they can leverage off world-leading geneticists and physiologists, people in communications, people in the music, and to get together a team of world's greatest scientists to common purpose and to leverage what's best of Stanford science and technology. Um, we all know that you know, the nation is reducing its funding for medical research. I will tell you the happy news. Our folks are extraordinarily good at this, and we get an incredible number of grants, but it's getting tougher and tighter, and the support of folks are important. This, I'll give you an example, is a fluidine system. It was about $350,000. It was contributed uh, by very generous donors. And this has led to a seminal paper in which Stefan Heller and his research team were able to take the primitive embryo and track individual cells through development, single cells, and see what they would form. Uh, Nicholas Grier just joined us. Nicholas is there. Maybe give us a wave. He's a brilliant, excuse me, you're going to blush. He's a brilliant young scientist. He's from France, and uh, he thinks very creatively. Part of him coming here was help from folks supporting this effort. Yeah. Um, I just want to leave you with the message from Lily. Now, Lily, Kate's mom, was reading to her this book about Oliver Getz hearing aids, and here's what Lily said at the end. And what happens at his birthday party this year, do you think, now that he can hear? Happy. Now with that, I would like to, uh, to introduce Lily's proud grandfather, Tom. Tom Evslin. It's a real pleasure um, to introduce Fint Cerf. Um, of course, Rob stole the line that everybody knows about him anyway, that he's the father of the internet. Uh, but what I know from having had the privilege of working with him from time to time is he was no absentee father. He not only invented TCP IP, he not only put the at sign into email addresses, uh, but he stuck around so that the internet, which was a technical invention and then a way for universities to communicate and then to communicate with defense suppliers, uh, became the fabric of our lives that it is today. Uh, and that, the internet growing to be as much a part of our lives as it is, um, is as much Vint's work as the, original invest, as the original invention. His work on ICON, his tireless work um, to improve the internet, to improve, improve the way society uses the internet, to improve internet governance, um, has been enormously important to what the internet has become in all of our lives. It's, it's fascinating that when we're talking about communication today, um, we're talking about something that Vint has done so much for. And yet, we're talking about a different kind of communication today. We're talking about a different kind of impedance than a crossed wire or a malfunctioning router. But we're still talking about how information gets from one place to another. Uh, perhaps uh, because he has hearing problems himself, Vint's one of the best listeners I know. Uh, and if you were to talk to his, you'd get the same compliment from anyone who's ever had the privilege of working with Vint. Um, and Vint's ability to communicate with humans, as well as to get machines to communicate over wires and over fiber, has made an enormous difference to the world that we live in today. Uh, just a few of the honors that Vint's had um, is the National Medal of Technology, uh, the Marconi Prize, which we were privileged to see him receive in New York, uh, something I've never heard of called the Prince of Astoria Award, but perhaps he'll explain what that <laughs> is, uh, the Turing Award, which is very prestigious, the President's Medal of Freedom, well-deserved, the Japan Prize, the Queen Elizabeth Prize of Engineering, and just recently, the French Legion of Honor. Um, apparently, he's been serving in the French Legion uh, <laughs> in his spare time. He does spend a lot of time outside the, outside the country. 
Um, there's a, another interesting parallel between what we're learning about today um, and Vint's career. Uh, one of the reasons why the internet is so successful is it's a self-organizing, self-healing structure. Um, and it, it fixes itself or it works around its problems. And of course, the human body is very much like that as well, that when one organ is damaged, another organ can take over for it. It has enormous properties of regeneration. Unfortunately, somewhere in our evolutionary history, we lost the ability to regenerate our hair cells. Apparently, some common ancestors of ours and the chicken could do that, uh, and we unfortunately forgot how. Uh, but the work that's being done here uh, the work that we've been privileged, we, we visited again Dr. Heller's lab this afternoon, the work that we see being done here is setting the stage to release that power of regeneration, to recapture that power of regeneration. It's not that they're going to build hair cells, but they'll perhaps allow hair cells to rebuild themselves without whatever genetic damage they had, uh, as Dr. Jackler was explaining. Uh, but much more qualified to talk about all this, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce my good friend, Vint Cerf. Vint, thank you very much for being here. <laughs> So I'm fibrillating a little bit because I, I guess it was better to be up here so I was theoretically lip-readable. Uh, the side effect of that is I occasionally have to turn to look at my own slides. Uh, but I wanted to make a few observations about what we just heard. First of all, I want to thank Tom for a lovely introduction. What is it they say? Of all the introductions I've had, that was the most recent. <laughs> Tom and I have known each other and worked together since about 1983. And uh, although he didn't tell you about himself, I can say a little bit. He was very much involved in the development of something called MCI Mail, which was an electronic mail service uh, developed way back 31 years ago. Uh, so we've known each other for over 30 years. And he has been one of those components of this very distributed internet environment and made a lot of contributions to its infrastructure and its technology, and so I want to thank Tom for that as well. Uh, it also occurred to me to uh, answer the question, why Stanford? It's a simple answer, the weather's better. <laughs> you know, what else do you need? Uh, the other observation I wanted to make about early stages of cochlear implant development, there was a man named Graham Clark, uh, who is in Australia, who is also credited with very early work uh, in this space uh, as well. And so it's amazing how long it takes to go from the ideas to the execution and availability of either a, a therapy or an instrument. And so we're talking 30 to 40 years. I'm hoping that what we will hear from the panel persuades us that it may not take that many years uh, to achieve some measure of success. But people need to understand that science has to take some patience. You have to be persistent, and you have to be patient in order to get results. Uh, the uh, point about the regeneration in the chicken, which both of our speakers have mentioned, causes me to wonder that uh, if, you, if you actually receive uh, therapy which produces this regeneration, does it cause you to lay eggs? <laughs> this is to be determined, right? So let me, let me begin, though, by um, giving you a little sense of what's happening in the internet today. If I could get the next slide. So what you're seeing here is a kind of compendium of things that are becoming part of the internet. And we're all accustomed to using laptops and desktops and tablets, and now increasingly mobiles, like the one over there. We're accustomed to seeing these kinds of computer-based devices on the net. I'm here to tell you that the internet has reached the point where literally billions of devices will be part of its environment. Ordinary devices around the house, the ovens, the refrigerators, uh, the picture frames, uh, the uh, auditory systems, uh, entertainment systems, the television sets, and in the offices, the same thing. Sensors will be all over the place. The thing I want to emphasize is that we will live in a very, very connected world. And it's even conceivable to me 
that some of the methods for recovering hearing or providing assistance to people who need it may actually become part of the internet environment in addition to being something that we just have on our persons. So that's a kind of exciting possibility. But what this translates into uh, is a really large family of things that can interact with each other. And that, I think, is going to be an interesting future for all of us. Now, I do get a little worried about the refrigerators that are part of the internet. The, the um, processors that are used to make the uh, refrigerators part of the network are sufficiently powerful that if they are taken over by a bad guy, we may see headlines saying, Bank of America attacked by 100 million refrigerators in the United States <laughs> in a denial of service attack. So a lot of us who have some responsibility for the internet and its security and safety are going to have to start worrying about the refrigerators and the ovens and the picture frames in addition to the bad guys with their laptops and desktops. Well, I want to switch over to the subject of, of today's uh, discussion, and that's hearing, hearing loss and hearing repair. Um, see, now I got to keep turning. I was born in 1943, and I was six weeks premature. And that apparently led to a sensory neural loss, which was progressive. So by the time I was 13, it was severe enough that I started to wear hearing aids. I've been very lucky, though, that my hearing has gotten worse about 1 dB per year. But the hearing aids have gotten better, faster than 1 dB per year. So I've managed to function in the hearing world thanks to hearing aids, which I wear uh, to this day. Um, the email is up there for a very good reason. My career has worked out well because visual communication has been available to me for well over 40 years. Electronic mail was invented in 1971, not necessarily by me, but by my colleagues who worked on the predecessor to the internet called the ARPANET. And so electronic mail turned out to be the most popular application invented in that system. And what's interesting about it is that within a few weeks of the invention of networked electronic mail, it became very clear that it was a social phenomenon. We thought of it as being a way to overcome time zone differences so that you could communicate even if you weren't both awake at the same time, unlike a telephone. But what we discovered within a few weeks of its invention is that distribution lists were very convenient for sharing information. The first distribution list that was developed was called Sci-Fi Lovers, Science Fiction <laughs> Lovers, because we were all geeks, and we all read science fiction. And so we were comparing notes about authors and stories. The next distribution list that came out of Stanford in this same year was called Yum Yum. It was a restaurant review distribution <laughs> list. And so for many people who see social networking as something new, you should know that it's been around in one form or another in the network environment for over 40 years. So I've been very lucky that all of these communication technologies have essentially made it possible for me to function in what would otherwise be a very challenging world. But I had it lucky compared to my wife, Sigrid, who's down here in the front row. Um, Sigrid was born in May of 1943, and she had normal hearing until she was three years old. She had spinal meningitis, a very, very high temperature, destroyed the ciliar hairs inside the cochlea that Dr. Jackler was talking about. And so she became profoundly deaf. In 1946, she went to the John Tracy Clinic in Los Angeles where her mother was helped to prepare to keep her speech as normal as possible. And so she helped Sigrid continue to speak normally. Now, it's very important as I go into this story that you understand that she is post-lingually deaf. So she had the experience of hearing before she lost her hearing. So a lot of things went on in her brain that captured the experience of sound unlike someone who was born deaf and never heard sound at all. But that was very important for her subsequently. Uh, she spent 50 years totally deaf and was lip reading in order to survive. She raised two sons that way, which is a big challenge. She did it very well. They're two very, very fine young men. 
However, when we moved to Washington, D.C. from Stanford in 1976, her lip reading was so good that I thought she was working for the CIA, but she couldn't tell me. <laughs> and we never quite got that sorted out. But a few years later, I think I got that, uh, in 1996, she used the internet to discover the current state of the art of cochlear implants and contacted people at Johns Hopkins University, particularly John Neparco, who has since moved to USC. And he has the otolaryngology department there, just as you do here. So um, Sigrid got her first cochlear implant in 1996. And this was a really interesting experience. I hope you all know that this is an outpatient operation. It takes about 45 minutes or an hour to install one of these things. And then, it was, and then you go home. And you wait for a couple of weeks, maybe three or four, until everything heals. And then you go back to be activated, which sounds vaguely religious. But in any case, <laughs> Sigrid gets her cochlear implant and her speech processor. And the speech processor, of course, is essentially hearing for Sigrid because it takes sound in. It figures out which frequencies are present. It figures out which electrodes inside the cochlear implant to activate to fool the brain into thinking it can hear. And the thing that's most astonishing about the device is that we have understood how the brain interprets those signals as sound, and we are reproducing them. So you get this matrix that says this uh, frequency has come in at this amplitude, and I will stimulate this electrode either continuously or with a pulse uh, signal. So Sigrid comes home with her brand new cochlear implant. And the first thing she does is get on the phone. And I discover when I get home, I have a 50-year-old teenager. <laughs> I can't get her off the telephone. Every call that comes in, especially from the telemarketers, she answers. Now, remember, I'm working for MCI at the time. And the phone rings. It's AT&T calling. And Sigrid says, hello. Oh, where are you? Oh, you're in India. Which country are you in? And half an hour goes by, and this poor salesperson on the other end says, so you're going to switch, aren't you? And she says, no, my husband works for MCI, but thanks for calling. <laughs> then she, now this is important. She was very aggressive about not letting any decibel go undetected. And so she herself developed her own post-operation uh, rehabilitation program. So she called the library and said, can I subscribe to recorded books for the blind? And she wanted to hear words that she hadn't heard. She knew what they were. She could read them. But she didn't necessarily know what they sounded like. So the library, she's on the phone, right? So the librarian says, oh, absolutely, of course. What's your name and your phone number and your, your address? And then she says, now, uh, you're blind, aren't you? And she says, no, I'm deaf. And there's this long pause. <laughs> it's a, how the hell is that going to work? She listened to over 500 books on tape. And the consequence of this is that she now recognizes accents. And she knows when people have mispronounced words, which apparently happens a lot on those recordings. She got patch cords. So when you go on the plane, you know where you normally stick the headset in to the, to the armrest, she plugs in her patch cord that goes into the speech processor auxiliary input. And the only sound she hears is coming from the movie, not the screaming kid that's two seats away, because it's only electronic sound, no acoustics at that point. This is cool. And of course, if she's looking for silence, <laughs> nothing. Let's see. She also got uh, FM transmitters and receivers. These are, uh, I guess these are made by, um, help help, what company makes those? They would... Phonak. I'm sorry? Phonak. Phonak, that's right. So um, these things uh, operate using uh, FM radio. And you, you can, for example, uh, I could be wearing an FM transmitter. And Sigrid could be 150 feet away and hear me. So she's got one right here. So if you'll unzip that, we'll, uh, we'll show everybody. So the part, the, her favorite trick is to go to a noisy restaurant. And with her um, FM transmitter here, that's assuming you don't destroy it while you're taking it out of the bag. Thank you. 
Okay, so here it is. This is the antenna, and this is the, um, thank you. This is, this is the microphone uh, on the side here, and this, the rest of it is the transmitter and the battery. So her favorite trick is, in addition to the fact that this is directional, so she can listen to who's talking, but her favorite trick is to just leave it on the table and excuse yourself to go to the ladies' room. <laughs> Of course, this is still transmitting. So when she comes back, of course, she can continue the conversation because he heard everything everybody said. So we have to tell everybody, look, don't say anything that you'd be embarrassed about because Sigrid might be listening. So the, the, the important message here, quite honestly, is that technology has come a very, very long way towards helping people with assistive devices, assuming that you get the proper training and the proper rehabilitative uh, exercise. And she also gave me, this is the receivers. These are tiny, tiny little things that plug into her speech processor. But I want to go to the next slide here. It's assuming I can get it to work. There we go. Uh, so the first thing uh, I want to say is that hearing aids are electronic devices that have gotten better and better over time, including the ones I wear. They're very dynamic now. They will um, increase the um, amplitude of a, of a very uh, low sound, and they will not increase the amplitude of a high sound so that you get some balance. You hear soft sounds as well as you hear the loud ones. They protect you from really loud sounds by not amplifying at all. So hearing aids have gotten to be pretty good. The cochlear implants we just talked about but the thing uh, that is uh, still in research, and I think maybe uh, Rob could tell us about that, are stem implants. These are things that go not into the cochlea, but into the uh, brainstem uh, of the auditory nerve. This is a much more complicated proposition because you have to figure out which nerves to connect to and which ones do you stimulate in order to get the brain to believe it's hearing. But the thing that we're here to talk about is recovery of the basic functionality of the inner ear. And that's the thing that I'm excited about. And I know pretty much everybody in the room wouldn't be here if you weren't excited about it, too. The possibility of literally recovering ear function by biological means would be a stunning outcome. And we're here to find out how far along has that research gotten, what else needs to happen, and what can we do to help. So I thank you for that. Could I have? The, uh, the rest of the panel up on the stage, and we're going to explore exactly that question. Thank you. I'm Tom Epson. I'm Lily's grandfather. Um, we've been acquainted with the work here at Stanford for a while. Um, we're privileged to be able to make donations to some of Dr. Heller's earlier work and are absolutely delighted uh, to see the progress that's been made. I'm Suzanne moller Kolodny. I'm an undergraduate at Stanford way back when. Um, and I'm going to talk about being hard of hearing, born with a hearing loss, a profound uh, hearing loss, and share that story with you. I'm Stefan Heller. I'm a professor in the Department of Otolaryngology. Um, I've been brought here by Rob Jackler nine years ago uh, to start a journey that brought us all together here to build a research team or help in hiring people with a, a very primary focus, which is to find uh, biological cues for hearing loss um, and through basic research and through collaborating with clinicians and engineers to get there. And um, that's also why we're here tonight, right? We've met. Yeah, <laughs> right. So first question, I think this goes to the two of you. Where are we right now in terms of this research? I mean, what do we now have the ability to do and what is it that we still don't know how to do? What, is, what remains? And can you help us understand how hard is it to get further than where we are? Help us understand where we are before we all have to turn into chickens in order to get right. our hearing re re returned. I think we have come a pretty far away. I think hearing the loss and research on the inner ear has been really hampered a lot by a te technological um, uh, difficulties. Uh, the ear is a very difficult organ to study. It's deep inside the bone of the skull, um, which is the, probably the, the hardest bone in the human body. So actually getting through there is really difficult. 
And then, I'm sorry to interrupt. This has been suggested that for lip reading purposes, we should stand up while we talk. All right, OK. Mm -hmm. So stand up. Thank you. <laughs> Where are the lip readers? OK, okay. Uh, I'll try not to wave around a little. <laughs> right. So, so the, the question was, wh where are we? And where, how, do, how did we get there? Um, we, we have come a long way. The year is really difficult to study. It's, it's deep inside the, most, most the hardest bone of the body. Um, the sensory cells, the hair cells that are in the ear, they are only a few thousands per cochlea. And if you compare this to um, a retina, mm -hmm. a, an eye, there are about 200 million photoreceptors in a single retina. So if you go to the slaughterhouse and you get eyes from cows or so, you can study these eyes at all levels of, 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 of investigation. You can actually do uh, enzymatic tests, all kinds of things. In the year, you have only a couple of 10,000 cells. And getting to them takes about, uh, for a skilled uh, biologist or a medical uh, a medical doctor in an animal it takes about 15 minutes or so but that's already a long time and l lots of these cells are actually very sensitive and are dying so we had a really hard time getting to this tissue and learn how to study it so it was always harder as a sane scientist and that's a problem over the years uh, looking for labs where you do your research. You go to a lab where you have a paper within a year. So you go to an eye lab if you're interested in sensory biology, if you're, unless you're insane. If you're insane, you choose a hearing lab because the challenges <laughs> are much harder, right? Or you're a person who, are, who is motivated by challenges. Um, and there are few in our field who are that, but labs that work on hearing uh, are rare. And labs who work on hearing restoration are even rarer. There are maybe a dozen worldwide. Um, that said, uh, I think the, the technological advance over the last five to 10 years that came to us was that we learned more and more to recognize the difficulties. So about 25 years ago, it was discovered that chickens can regenerate hair cells. And that caused uh, a steer of excitement. A lot of people were jumping in this field and were saying, OK, we're going to solve this in five years. We know how this works. It got frustrating. People couldn't figure it out. It was very difficult uh, for the reasons I stated. Uh, very few cells, difficult to study, and so forth. So we learned more of the roadblocks over the last five to 10 years. And maybe identified the problems that we are having. And that, I think, is a big advance. Now we know what we are dealing with. And now we know how to tackle it. In parallel, there's a technological revolution happening around us. Um, there's a lot of novel technology developed at, at multiple levels. We can now sequence whole genomes. We can now sequence uh, inside a single cell what is being uh, 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 produced in terms of genes, which genes are on in a single cell and which genes are on in a different cell in the ear. So we know with unprecedented detail uh, something about the identity of the different cells that, are, that we are dealing with and about the identity of the cells that we are trying to restore. We learned a lot about the electrophysiology of the cells, how the system works electrically. And there's a lot, still a lot more to discover. Uh, but I think now knowing what we're up to is exactly where we are. And knowing that there's technology around us that we can utilize and bringing in this technology in a way that was not implemented, in a way it was not implemented before, is exactly where we are. And this is where we, where we start to build on, I think. So the future is going to be exciting and great. That's well, what I'm motivated We're going to find out some more about that. Maybe, okay. Dr. Jackler, maybe, you, thank you. Maybe you could say a little bit uh, about what is, has, uh, is not being pursued anymore, for example. Have we decided that there are some uh, uh, avenues of research that didn't uh, prove out, and are there new ones that you're pursuing? So how do we, uh, how do yeah. we judge that? And how, have, how have things changed? Yeah, I, I think that, like most fields, that Resilience in the face of failure and overcoming <laughs> barriers is what distinguishes success in science. And I think we're at a point where many successes have now happened. And I think Stefan is very modest. Now, I get asked all the time, when will we have it? When can I sign up? 
<laughs> is this going to be for Lily before she's in college? Mm -hmm. When will it be available? And the answer to that is simply, we don't know. But I can tell you this. What we know today is I have an abiding faith that this is now going to work. We've uh, So many core technologies, so many core aspects of biology have been worked out. We are years away, but whether that's a decade from beginning clinical trials, or 15 years, or seven years, I don't know. What I do know is it is a relatively small group. Even here, we're the world's leading group, most creative group, most advanced group. But it's relatively modest scale. So this is our Manhattan Project. Our desire is to scale up, to shorten the timeline. We know that timeline will occur. But will it occur in the lifetime of a child today? Will it have to wait until those children grow up? And this is what we're concentrating on mm -hmm. very much. So you know, Stefan is famous for the things that he's done in creating um, new hair cells in mammals and working in human tissues now to produce new um, hair cells. Um, and Tony Ritchie is famous for having validated that these cells have signatures electrophysiologically that are similar to a functioning hair cell. And um, Mirna and others have looked at the interplay of the nerves growing to the newly regenerating cells. So many of those aspects are there. But we are a number of years away. But with concentrated effort, as we draw people into this field and we put resources into this field, you know, I will make the point. The war on cancer began during the Nixon administration some 40 years ago. I'm very much in favor of it. And it has made many important fundamental contributions. But it has not cured cancer. It has not overcome it categorically. In this area, which has a very modest degree of funding and a very small band of researchers working in it, with a very modest investment compared with the billions that go every year in the, in the cancer research realm, uh, it could categorically overcome a form of human disease, at least in a large fraction of people who have hair cell loss. So before you sit down, mm. uh, you mentioned in your talk genetics and that it might have a role to play in the uh, recovery of hearing. Uh, so can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, do we need to observe development of the hair cells in the course of, uh, of evolution while the, I don't mean evolution, the development of a fetus, for example? At what point do the hair cells show up? Do we need to understand more about the physiology of of the hair cell generation. And when you play this uh, game of stimulating hair growth, what is it that causes the nerve cell to figure out where it's supposed to go? Do we understand that? Yeah. Do we need in situ measurement capability to observe these things actually happening? Yeah. Well, let me um, take the first part. Okay. Um, which was, and I must be getting senior. I went, yeah, because you, your push down stack overflowed. What about genetics? <laughs> the genetics. I, know, I have the same let me, problem. Let me comment. Uh, my, wait, reboot. The, the, okay. The, yeah, so the, the, the genetics question. So, if you knew what my uh, you know, genetic sequence was, how would that help yeah. so, uh, recover my hearing? Let me say that, in, interestingly enough, that auditory genetics is more advanced than most other areas in the human body. Wow. It is extraordinarily so. And some 200 or so genes have been identified throughout the 23 human chromosome. Uh, and, and the advantage of that, and this comes from inbred populations in small islands and things, okay. where they were able to identify and sequence the genes. Now, when you understand the DNA code, you know, it was often asked, once we know the human genome, so what? Well, the so what is, you then know the protein product that elaborates from that gene. And you know that that protein product is essential for the bioenergetics of hearing, for the structural biology of hearing, for the function mm -hmm. of hair cell mm -hmm. transduction, for example. So we're learning a lot about how the ear actually functions from genetics. In terms of the ability to actually go in, splice, and repair, there are some early phase experiments that have been done looking, for example, at an adenovirus to place in missing genes. And there is at least a few studies that have shown in mice the ability to functionally improve hearing through that. It's in its infancy, but I do believe these kinds of technologies in the inner ear will be possible with time. So that means if you use the mouse, the mouse therapy that instead of laying eggs, will suddenly have a great desire to eat cheese. OK. <laughs> I could live with that. <laughs>
Um, maybe uh, either one of you could say a little bit more about what's happening at Stanford in ototoxicity research. That's, maybe Ms. Dr. Heller could say a bit uh, about that. Maybe I just start off. Uh, um, Ototoxicity is really a big problem worldwide. Uh, Maybe we should explain right. what does the ototoxicity actually mean. It's right. It's when, uh, an, an easy example is when you take uh, a drug, there are certain antibiotics that are used for treatment of very dangerous uh, infections. Um, uh, they also attack the hair cells of the inner ear. And there are people who are more susceptible to this uh, antibiotics and other people that are less susceptible. That's a question of genetics. At some point, we will very likely know um, whether a person is highly susceptible or not, and then we can adjust the treatment. But imagine the third world or countries that do not have these capabilities. So autotoxicity is a major cause of deafness worldwide. Um, as it turns out, the aminoglycosides, the antibiotics that are causing ototoxicity, as well as potentially other drugs that cause ototoxicity, sneak into the hair cell via uh, an opening. And this opening is actually the, the mechanosensor that is used oh, okay. for you to detect sound. And this research is done by my colleague Tony Ritchie and also my colleague Alan Cheng. Tony figured out that the aminoglycoside drug is flooding in your body and is attacking all the bacteria. It's all over your body. It usually doesn't get into cells, but the hair cell provides a unique opening. Wow. And that opening is asymmetrically shaped so that the drug can get into the hair cell. But it can't get back it out. It cannot get out. It's a roach mouth, wow. right? <laughs> Mousetrap. <laughs> and that means one drug gets in, the hair cell can deal with it. But over the time of the treatment, because you're, being, you're, get, you're getting this drug usually intravenously over a long period of time, another drug molecule gets into your hair cell, another drug molecule, and another drug. So it accumulates. It gets enriched into hair cells. Inside the hair cell, the drug looks for a target. And the drug looks at something that is inside all of your cells. It's called mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And mitochondria are little tiny energy machines, but evolutionary, they came from bacteria. So all of a sudden, the drug does what it does drug best, does, does do best. It actually attacks bacteria in your hair cell, which the, the next best thing is the mitochondria. And usually, it never gets to these mitochondria. Long story short, it kills the hair cells. Now, we know how the perpetrator gets in. So, we can now do two things. We can actually try to manipulate the door so the drug cannot longer get in. But that would mean we need to have a second drug and then give that to patients. Or we take existing aminoglycoside drugs, and they are, they are chemical molecules, and we add something mm -hmm. to that drug that prevents it from getting into the door, but that still maintains its efficiency. And this is exactly the strategy that Tony Ritchie and Alan Chang are taking on. And Tony and Alan are here, and you uh, we'll, can find them later and ask them about their ability to uh, their, 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 their work and how they take this general concept that they had and use a Stanford mechanism, which is there's a, there's a, there's a program called the SPARC program, where you can actually meet once a week. <laughs> Um, it's Wednesday's night, right? Uh, right. It's usually Wednesdays. They serve good food, and they <laughs> they actually have people from uh, the venture world and from engineering, people who are formerly in, formerly in industry and now interested in helping. And it brings people together. Communication. That's all. And Tony was actually telling the story that we have now a way of perhaps preventing hearing loss in potentially. 100 million people or more. And it just takes a little bit of um, pushing this project further, uh, a little chemistry, right? And so he got together with the right people, and they are now really pushing this. They have, I think, synthesized about 30 or 50 derivatives of these aminoglycosides. And some of them are not ototoxic at all or have a much higher reduced ototoxicity while maintaining its antimicrobial activity. So now the, the, the challenge is to get this drug 
in a, in a sensitive way out into the public, so it actually is not horribly expensive. So it's getting used all over the world. And then, so Tony is very sensitive in finding the right partners to actually develop this further. And you can talk to him about it. He's more the expert, and Ellen Chang as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, at some point, and maybe uh, when we uh, reconvene out there, we can learn a little bit more about what areas of research would benefit the most from additional funding and why it is that some of those areas of research are not getting the kind of attention they should get, say, from NIH. Um, but I'd like to pick up a little bit uh, with Tom and, and uh, Suzanne. Dan, Suzanne. Uh, so Tom, let me look at it from, from your point of view. This man is an entrepreneur, right? He started many companies. He's a serial entrepreneur. Um, and I guess now that you've had exposure uh, to this over a period of time, how would you see this if you were explaining to a venture capital company whether they should invest in the research? What would you have to say? Good question. And actually, Mary and I together are incurable serial entrepreneurs. Um, but what I would say if I were here in Silicon Valley talking to a venture capitalist, uh, maybe I am, um, that they, these guys got the algorithm. You know, the, the app will come along pretty soon, but, but they got the algorithm. And, and People have done very well, and I'm not talking about making money now, but making a difference. People have done very well in investing in good algorithms that come out of Stanford. Um, and they, um, they're still not at the point where it's a slam dunk. They're not at the point where drug companies, there'll be a point where the exit strategy will be drug companies will fund it because there's a lot to be done in making drugs. They'll probably be at a point where government will provide more funding than it does because it's a sure thing. But right now, somebody who's got the mentality of a VC or even better, the mentality of an angel investor can see the progress that's been made. I was in Dr. Heller's lab this afternoon and could see them using their gene sequencer, using their various technologies, using data visualization techniques, so that they understand an enormous amount what's going on um, as stem cells develop, as um, hair cells develop, uh, what's going on inside the inner ear, even though we can't see there. Uh, they're all set to start trying different strategies, to measuring the effects of those strategies, to tuning those strategies, um, and building that into a killer app. What's really exciting about investing in this now is that, I, you know, I, obviously if Dr. Jackler doesn't know, I don't know either whether it's <laughs> five years or 15 years, um, or at what point it is that Lilly benefits directly from this research, but what I do know, what I can see, um, is that it's on a track to success. It's on a track to conclusion. And that their research is going to do to most forms of inner ear deafness what Uber's done to the taxi industry. So no, this is the time you. to invest. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tom. Well done. So Suzanne, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your experience with deafness uh, and how it is that you have gotten interested in, from the philanthropic point of view, trying to pursue this research. So maybe what, what's your story? Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm actually a person who was born with a hearing loss. Um, I had an ototoxic drug, a gendomycin, uh, given to my mom when she was delivering me. And so it wiped the entire high frequency losses. So I have a profound um, I'm considered profoundly deaf in that area. Um, but my mom did not realize, and at the time, if you're born today in a hospital, they, they test their hearing today, and they're able to give children, infants, hearing aids or cochlear implants. But I wasn't diagnosed until two years old. My mom took me to a doctor. She happened to major in speech in college, and she knew that I was not enunciating my words like other students at two. And she took me to the doctor, and the doctor gave me the diagnosis and told my mom that I'd be dependent on my, on my parents for the rest of my life. I wouldn't be able to go to any school. And, um, um, my mom refused to believe that. So she looked around the world and found about an, a uh, doctor called Dr. Howard House, who at the time was starting a new organization called the House Ear Institute. And he was the first doctor in the 70s to give hearing aids to children. 
and also encourage my parents to start um, speech therapy. So twice a week before school, from the age of two and a half until 16 years old, I took speech therapy lessons. And I'm, I'm sharing with, with, this, with you because I had the resources to do this. I had my parents being able to give me hearing aids and uh, all the speech therapy. But there are thousands of children today who don't have access to that. And that's what encourages me to be here today, is speak about the fact that I was able to go to Stanford and graduate and go to UCLA Business School and was provided with real-time captionist in, in the classes to get academically the best I could do. So um, I'm grateful here and very excited. I love hearing aids, but I want the hearing aid business to be out of business. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> well, let me just get one or two more, and then we'll have a chance to go out and chat more closely with uh, the rest of the uh, research staff. Uh, I, the, one, the thing that I guess I'd like to hear the most about is what are the areas of greatest need that would benefit the most from incremental funding? And I don't know which of the two of you would like to try to address that, but that will help give us a sense for what is really vital at this point. Yeah. Well, let me start, and then I'm going to pass it over to Stefan. There are some areas that we would benefit from immediately. We talked about the importance of studying development. Mm -hmm. And really, we could use a couple of individuals working on the molecular signals, which, in fact, Stefan and others have worked okay. out uh, within the normal development sequence, because this is useful for exploitation. And many of the issues in, in regenerating an ear simulate mm -hmm. the biological tasks in development. Engineers are very important. And we have wonderful collaboration. And the, the aminoglycoside project that Dr. Ritchie and Chang are doing that is so very promising is a collaboration with chemical engineering yeah, yeah. when they conceptualize. I thought you were an electrical engineer. I am, but I'm an engineer first. You know. <laughs> well, you know, and surgeons are engineers, I think, in many ways. And um, you know, this is one thing, the proximity of this campus. When I um, visited Stefan, and we talked about coming to Stanford and really creating, under his leadership, the scientific group, um, he looked at Stanford and says, you know, where I'm in Boston, it's really hard to collaborate with engineers at MIT. It's hard to be over in Cambridge because he was separated. Uh, okay. Here, everybody's together. It's the weather. It is the weather yeah. and the proximity and the bicycles. Yes. That's what brings it up. So, so I think, really, um, there are a number of specialties, but there's also, frankly, the best people. And when you come down to it, in fact, we'd very much like to recruit about a half a dozen of the absolute best and brightest. Now, you might say, why? Because in the Manhattan Project, you brought together Bohr yeah. and Oppenheimer in one place. And there is a resonance, and there is a chain reaction that occurs. When you bring the best and brightest people together with the most advanced technology and skills, together surrounded by people in other fields, because at the intersection of disciplines yeah. is a place where the best, um, um, the best innovation occurs to exploit the technologies and the insights into biology across fields. So this is really what's most important in the generic sense. We have a wonderful world-beating group, but it's not big enough to do it in the speed that we wish to do it. And great progress. And you know, in the end of the day, you know what our goal is? To cure hearing loss and move on to something else. Exactly. You know, so you know what I find really, yes, let's, let's go for that. <laughs> What, what I find really interesting about this answer is that it wasn't about a specific technology. It wasn't about a particular physiological problem or a technical problem, in situ measurement or anything else. It was people. People really count. Well, I don't know whether you have anything to add to right. that stuff. Yeah, there's, it's difficult to add anything. I mean, I, I think the original idea is really the Manhattan Project or the moonshot. And you have a couple of Oppenheimers and Tellers and people around. But I, I, I think it's, it's all about a concerted effort. Uh, and, and this field is so small, and it's really difficult to, uh, to, to build something uh, be, because you can recruit people locally. I think it takes an effort where we, where we actually identify people worldwide and say, OK, this is the group of six to 10 people that we really would like to recruit and bring together and provide them with funding so that they can work together, let's say, for 10 years and put them together in an environment that doesn't have a lot of uh, 
uh, uh, issues with communication, where, where, you, where, you, where you have people from the business side there, where, where an idea can be taken in the Stanford fashion and can be moved right away into a, a, a company, potentially, because when Big Pharma gets involved, it's better to get them involved to really drive the drug business, for example, or to have the MDs around and bring them on board because they help in building a clinical trial and helping uh, to really translate the research and, and work with patients right away. So it is about bringing together people. There are lots of small problems where a seed funding can provide a lot of, make a lot of impact on a particular individual lab. And I have experienced this in the last couple of years, which is great for the lab. It brings research forward. But in the big picture of things, it is more the project and the, 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 the initiative uh, and really to bring together a group of people that, that really moves research forward. And this, I think there's no other place in the world that has this kind of vision and we are in the process of building this group. We are far from being at the point where I would say we are ready to take off. Uh, it will take quite a while to get there and it will actually take quite a bit of um, um, money actually also to be there, right? Um, but I mean, the research is all motivated to go this way, no matter what. I mean, for me, I'm happy. I like what I do. I, I, I try to get funding from an I, I It's not about my lab and it's not about my research. I think it's about the bigger picture. That's so I'm going to, thank you. I'm going to make an observation about uh, the internet project, something that uh, Tom implied in his talks. Some of you may not realize it, but the internet research began actually with the ARPANET in 1969. It started at UCLA. The Defense Department funded that project for 21 years until 1990. The ARPANET project started in 1973. The funding for that has not ended. The National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and the National Aerospace Agency continues to fund research associated with internet. So it takes a long time and it takes persistent funding to make this stuff work. So not only do we need the critical mass of people, but we need a sustainable funding uh, picture for this work to materialize. So I think um, when we get out there to have this discussion, Tom, I would really love to, actually both of you, Tom and Suzanne, if you can help us see whether there are ways of providing incentive for the private sector to engage. Maybe there are some things that can come out of the research that don't necessarily solve the whole problem, but solve enough of the problem that it's worth investing in for, uh, for per, uh, commercial purposes. We need the incentive for that long-term funding. And I think that's the crux of success for this project. Well, I think I'd like to thank all of our panelists and then suggest that we go out there and have a deeper chat. Thank you very much. <laughs>